mantra of the American dream is to advance yourself with hard work, ingenuity, innovation. You can have it all. The frightening reality of the gospel. Jesus does call us to give up everything we have. And he may tell any one of us to sell all of our possessions and give them to the poor. But we don't believe this. If we form Jesus to look like us and be who we want him to be, then even when we gather together and sing our praises and lift our hands, the reality is we are not worshiping the Jesus of the Bible. We are worshiping and singing to ourselves. We have a master who demands radical obedience. A mission that warrants radical urgency. And we do not have time to waste our lives living out a Christian spin on the American dream. The most glorious reason you exist is for the proclamation of the glory of God to the ends of the earth. And it's more than having a nice life. It's about giving our lives and our families and our jobs for the proclamation of the glory of Christ to the ends of the earth. If we're going to live for the sake of 4.5 billion lost people and thousands and thousands and thousands of kids who are dying every day because they don't have food on their table, then that means radical change in our lives and our families and the church. Church, we are plan A, and there is no plan B. All right, let's pray. Time to go home. No. <laughs> Well, my name is David Whitmore. I uh, just came from Winter Haven, Florida, a little bit, little city between Orlando and Tampa. Anybody know where Cypress Gardens is? No, I didn't think so. Well, that's where I used to live. Um, I was a part of a really um, large-sized church in, in Winter Haven, and, and long story short, God just said, David, you got to do more. We had a large youth group. We had all the bells and whistles, huge stage, and all this wonderful American dream stuff. We had everything. Kind of like Ray, we um, left um, the church there and came here just by a simple word, do more. And we're here. We're going to be starting a church on the west side, and um, it's going to be an exciting adventure. So I appreciate the opportunity to come share with you guys. You guys will probably never invite me back after the word that God has asked me to share with you, to tell you the truth. Because what you just saw in the video is exactly my heart's desire for every Christian, and I know it's God's desire for every Christian. Three months ago, I took a team of 30 people to Nicaragua. I've grown up uh, my entire life in Southeast Asia. I've seen poverty. I've seen pain. But this year was an amazing year. And I don't think I'll ever be the same. Sometimes, you know, in our Christian world, we, we have all these really high highs, and then all of a sudden we come back from either America or just a, a service project, and then we're like two weeks later on, we're maintaining our everyday life. And that's, that's not what it's supposed to be. And I pray that that does not happen in my life and your life after today. Nicaragua. The median income of a family is $5 a week. A week. Not a day, not an hour, a week. And I don't know where your economic standards are. Maybe you're, you're like a millionaire. Maybe you make $35 um, a day. If you make $35 a day, you are rich in the eyes of the people in Nicaragua. There's one pastor friend that I met. I had the opportunity to come with quite a bit of money that our church raised to go over there and do anything for them. The simple question I asked these seven pastors, but one particular I'll get to in a second, I asked, what do you need? 
what do we need? And here I am coming in with a kind of like a pompous attitude, and I'm coming in and I say, yeah, we're Americans. I have X number of dollars. I didn't tell them how much. I said, tell me what you need, and let me write you a check, and, and we'll, get it, we'll get it done with. And I thought they were thinking, hey, let's get all these lights and these cameras. Let's be more American. That's not what they said. As I met the pastors, there's one church specifically that, that did not have walls. You hear churches, oh, a church without walls. You hear those? You know, okay. But it had a tin roof with four poles sticking up and a, a, a grass floor, and that was their church. I met him in his church, and he said, David, all I need are three things. I need chairs. We're tired of sitting on the ground. We will if we need to. If you can't get us chairs, no big deal. We will continue to stay on the ground and learn about God. The second thing they asked for are fans. Just fans. I know this winter or this summer here has been completely terrible here. Over there, it's a uh, it's hundred times worse. It, it's terrible, the heat, and all they ask are for fans. And I'm like, yeah, that's no big deal, but what do you want? I, I, I was waiting for, hey, I, I want a Mac laptop, Chad. I want a Mac laptop. I, I want this. I want that. I want, they want chairs and fans. And the third one shocked me. All they want is children's curriculum. Children's curriculum. Didn't ask for anything else. And they were genuine. They, were, they weren't being humble. They were saying, this is what we need so that's what they said the year before. So the year before we brought, the, this year we brought all these uh, flannel graphs. We thought we were big stuff, and we're like, hey, we're going to bring these, these flannel graphs. You have grown up with flannel graphs? It's like this board where you stick like, pictures on and stuff like that. We bought three years' worth of curriculum, and we went, we dropped them off at these seven churches. And this is what will get me every single time. The tears on the teachers and the parents' faces was something I will never forget because they were crying because they were sitting on a chair and not on grass with a fan blowing their hair, still about 100 degree feeling, it felt like 100 degrees, with flannel graph curriculum. And, they're saying, and they, oh, I did the whole training with them and they said, this is incredible, this is great. Can we use this with our adults? We're like, yeah, you can use it with whatever you need. They don't know the simple Bible stories that you and I might know. But didn't stop there. Our church donated almost about, uh, I think it was about three or 400 shoes, just pairs of shoes, brand new shoes, and we distributed them to the area. Normally, as the leader of this group, and Ray, you'll under, you know this, you go in, and as the leader, you're always in the back pointing at it, saying, you go here, you go there, you go everywhere. But all of a sudden, I got stuck. It wasn't necessarily stuck. It was a God thing. Normally, I let everybody else do the work, and I get to stand back and watch them be blessed and bless others. But this time, it was just crazy. Mobs of probably about 150 kids lining up, knowing that we were passing out shoes. So I'm trying to direct all these people. And here I am, before I know it, on my hands and knees. I'm on my hands and knees, literally, with a, a line of about 150 kids and right behind me were shoes. Shoes. And the mob of people, children, who desired shoes was an incredible thing. So here I am. They're lining up. And I'm, I'm right here. And I'm like, okay, I'll just do it myself. So I, I looked at the kids' feet. And without thinking, which is what is supposed to happen, I grabbed this kid's feet. And all of a sudden, I felt goo coming down the sides of my hands. The goo was not goo, it was poo, okay? So here I am picking up the kids' feet, and I said, I need this size. I, I need this size. So they're all throwing me shoes, and I put it there. The very first kid, and it didn't stop there, out of 150, I found the kids' shoe size. They're Walmart shoes, probably bought it on clearance for $5.50. I grabbed the shoe, and this I'll never forget I pass it up to the kid, and he was crying, crying because he had a new pair of shoes. 
I could be here all night and all day tomorrow or the next day sharing with you. And you guys know because of your hearts and what this church is all about. But when we look at America, I don't and we don't see the Christian life that Jesus and the Bible actually teaches. We don't see it. The church I came from was a church of all the, the lights and the cameras and the action, and that's good and fine, but as long as it's not the focal point. It's good. You can have all this wonderful stuff, and you can have air conditioning, but if it's the focal point, then you've messed up what the gospel and what God is all about. When we look at the churches of America, I'm sad to say that God is not going to bless America because of what we as Christians have become. And I'm the first to be the one guilty and to say, I am not where I need to be. I need to be total, radically sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I heard this one statement from somebody. I'm going to ask you the same question. Are you going to choose comfort or are you going to choose the cross? Are you comfortable where you live? Are you comfortable with the clothes you have on your back? Are you comfortable with who you are? If you were to just leave here and get raptured up and God would look at you in the face and say, what did you do for the kingdom of God? What did you do for my kingdom, the kingdom that I came, I gave my son, he died a gruesome death for you and for me. What did you do for me? And if you, can, if you can't say during that last week you've done anything radically for him, he would just shake his head and say, all right, you believe in me, you believe in my son, Coming to heaven. Because your foundation is there, and we'll get to that in a second. Your foundation and my foundation is there. We have a golden ticket to heaven. Yay, but what are we going to do with it? Today I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to encourage you with the following. I'm going to encourage you not, do not, Follow Christ. Don't do it. And Ray's like, what's your doctrine all about? You said, don't follow Christ? It's like, <laughs> what's going on? I'll get it to there. Don't follow Christ. Because what I'm about to share with you is what Jesus himself said to other people. And he was walking around, looking all out of the crowds and everything that was following him. And he was simply saying, don't follow me. It's not worth your life. It's not worth, it's not worth your, your health. It's not worth where you're going to live. If you're worried about that stuff, then don't follow me. What I'm about to share with you is a radical view. It's not Dave's or Ray's or Chad's. Is what Jesus Christ truly said. So if you have your Bibles, I want to share with you just a couple passages. Luke 9, it should be up on the screen. Yeah, Luke 9, 57 through 62. As they were walking, this is in starting in verse 57. Yeah, verse 57. As they were walking along the road. By the way, Jesus walked a lot. He didn't have a car, he didn't have a wagon, he didn't have a donkey until he went into Jerusalem. All right, so here he is walking along on a road. And a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. I think that's how we are sometimes. I think we're like, God, I will follow you. You have a great worship service and everything. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit comes upon you and says, I will worship you wherever you go. I will go, I will go, I will go. And then all of a sudden afterwards, a homeless guy walks by and you're not even willing to give him $5. I will go anywhere you want me. I will worship you. I will follow you. And then this is what Jesus says. Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place 
to lay his head. I would be excited if somebody, I'm starting a church, so I have nobody, and Ray knows how that is. We have nobody. And we're like, hey, if somebody comes up to you and says, I will follow you, I will help you start this church, I will go wherever you want to. I'd be like, yeah, sign on the dotted line, let's go and rock and roll. But Jesus didn't say that. He's like, the cost is too much. If you follow me, dude, if you, if you follow me, you might not have a place to lay your head tonight. You might be out on the side of the street without a house, without a roof, without anything. Are you willing to do that? God knew, Jesus knew his heart. He knew that he probably lived in a mansion somewhere. It doesn't say, but we can just kind of have fun. He lived at a mansion somewhere, and he's like, I will follow you. And Jesus said, 